disappears. So I'm rather hoping that everybody's on and I'm going to crack on and I'm going to ask you a question <clears throat> straight off that I'd love you to put your answer in the chat. We'll use Q&A later, uh, but let's put it in the chat because if I could help you with one thing in cross country, I'd be really interested to know what that one thing would be. One of the most sort of common factors is uh, most people come up with the, the word confidence and that I would put as quite a strong one for everybody on a foundation of confidence and you can move forward. And when I'm training, coaching my horse or people, if they are still <coughs> green, the horses and the people, then I feel the key is that things must be small and you can walk over things if they're small. I never like to feel a horse has the option to stop or to run out. And I think it takes the confidence out of him when something alters his equilibrium, his equilibrium is just to keep going forwards. And I think it certainly takes the confidence out of us, the riders. So that is my fundamental strategy. I never want my horse to know that he can stop or know that he can run out. So to gain the confidence of, of my horse and possibly of my rider, if they're feeling very unconfident, I find a cross country course with really small fences and we just walk, walk them scramble over, walk and jump, whatever. And then I'll do the same ones in trot. And then I might move to another area of the cross country course where they're probably a little bit too big, like two foot high instead of one foot or 30 centimeters, never have quite worked out what one foot is in centimeters um, and trot over those. And in trot, a horse is much less able to stop. And it's because he has one hind leg on the ground in trot, whereas in canter, he has simultaneously nearly simultaneously two hind legs so that's suddenly two huge power pistons to stop dead or to run out all of which don't help with his confidence or with yours so trotting is brilliant you've only got one power piston on the ground at the same time you can persuade your horse over things that he's really quite suspicious of out of trot that you won't do out of canter because a lot of people's answer <clears throat> when they feel they don't like a fence or they're having a problem is to go faster and I mean, sometimes it does work, but basically if a horse is going to learn to be brave and have his confidence in you, and therefore you can have your confidence in him, he needs to really understand what he's doing and really want to do it. It's, you can't force a horse. Um, you all know that. You, he's much stronger, much bigger. He's very strong willed. You can't force him. So I feel that, um, the system that we offer in the Cross Country Academy that Rachel Faulkner had this idea two and a half years ago in COVID that we should start training online. And she said to me, can you, can you write down a system? So I said, yes, let's do it. Why not? What fun, you can't get around to train anymore. And I'm terribly, terribly keen to get this message to anybody that will listen to it, that we have a lot of work to do if we're gonna keep cross country as the heartbeat of the sport. And it isn't just gonna become a sort of, slightly second rate dressage and show jumping with an exhibition cross country. We, we have got our work cut out on that. And so she said, I said, yes, let's, let's, let's do this academy because we'll probably actually get to more people than I would doing my clinics around the world. So she said, right, well, write down your system. I said, oh, forget it, I don't have a system. I just do it by feel what I see when I, I feel something coming in when I'm watching something, I feel something coming in when I'm riding. I don't have a system. I, I mean, I just not like that. I'm different to people that sort of learnt it in the book. And she's gone, you have to. There's no way we can teach online unless you have a system. So I sort of had to scratch my head and start to think about this. And of course I have got a system. And then I've really realized it. And I've taught for 40 years and clinics, 20 people a day and 1500 horses a year. So you do get a system and it was really fascinating because I had to write this down and gradually we realized what the key points were and we develop, developed the green print, which 
is a blueprint, but it's a green print. So <laughs> that that has been hugely interesting to me to actually have to formalize my feelings and what I teach and what I feel when I'm writing. And the other really interesting thing is we keep adding to it. We sort of had five or six points and I think we've probably got nine or 10 on the green print now. It keeps, something comes up when I'm just like, God, that should be on the green print. That is so important. But the extraordinary thing is that we didn't know, it's never been done before, training online cross country. It was been training online dressage and a little bit show jumping, but not cross country. So we didn't know if it was gonna work. And we have had a really interesting experience experiences with it because I still go all over the world but with rather less alacrity now doing clinics and every now and again I come across somebody who rides really well does does all the things I'm sort of feeling is is what I want them to do in order to be to be safe and to be able to give their horse confidence and to climb this climb the ladder to as high as they want to go and I sometimes say to them who's your trainer because in whatever country I'm in I like to gather a little list of trainers that I feel have the same uh, outlook as I do. Inevitably, I think it worked. <laughs> Otherwise I wouldn't be helping everybody with it. And more often than not, they come back and they say, it's, it's the academy, I'm on the academy. And I find it really has helped. So it sounds like a proper good plug for the academy, but it is because I really, really want you on it because the more people we have on it, the more the message can go out there, the better the horses will get trained, the more confidence you will have, the more confidence they will have. And I, I will hopefully edge our sport a little bit closer to being able to maintain cross country as its heartbeat. Otherwise, good luck doing dressage and show jumping and popping around a few logs, which is honestly the way it's gonna go if we don't really get ourselves into a position of understanding how you train a horse to be confident, understanding how you help yourself learn that trust. It's interesting. I was talking to Chris Bartle and Dickie, way good on a superb webinar we had a few weeks ago. And we talked about the dressage, the German dressage scales of training. And it was really interesting how they applied that to um, their cross country. And they, Dicky changed it a little bit by putting um, straightness as a more important thing than, um, what was it, let's have a look. So they go, the scales of training go, rhythm is number one, relaxation, mental and physical, which equals number three, suppleness, suppleness contact, straightness Dickie puts in before impulsion and then collection collection being the final thing collection being coffin canter if you like and the Germans have impulsion before straightness which is really interesting because every book you ever pick up the horse must go forwards but Dickie's point is that if he's not straight he cannot be in balance and straight round a turn is just as important as straight on the straight line. He cannot have all four legs under him in order to make the effort needed to spring over a fence or the cleverness needed to do his footwork if he's wrong in front of a fence. So he's he's gone rhythm, relaxation, sub contact, straightness, impulsion, collection. And the Germans go rhythm, suppleness, contact, impulsion, straightness, collection. So he's just inverted and has straightness before impulsion, which is a really important thing. And we encapsulate a certain amount of that in our straight line halt. One of the one of the parts of the green print is straight line halt. So once you've jumped a fence or jumped a course, canter away from that last fence so that the horse always leaves the fence with positivity and then say, right, the next obstacle is a halt and so then start to prepare your canter start to feel more coming together with your canter and start to sit up more and keep the calves on and then gradually start to use the voice whoa, 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 whoa. and if he's well trained he'll stop from canter if he's still very green he'll probably go through a few strides of trot you might have to be quite tough with your hands to say no this is a stop button i do mean stop and in so doing you start to put the, the, the stop and go button into your horse, both of which are vital. I think the problems that I see in clinics are very often to do with the horses not having that stop go button installed. And it is, it is really important that you do 
install that stop and go button. Um, and I don't like doing it too soon after a fence because I don't want the horse to associate that the fence is going to have a stop after it. But if he if he's rude and he just keeps dashing off, then yes, I will be tough on him and say, no, 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 listen to me. I am the captain of the ship and you do need to take that captain's hat off your head and please put it on mine. And I'll be firm, I'll be fair and I'll be consistent. And I think those are very important words. Oh, actually, it will add one to that. Firm, clear, and consistent. Um, I think there's so much uh, to be gained in confidence from a horse who is a, a, a reasonably simple being in so much as he can't reason. And if you look it up, you'll find that there are only two mammals, three actually, that can reason, and one of them is meant to be us. I say meant to be. Um, and the other is a dolphin and a type of chimpanzee, I believe. Otherwise, they, all mammals, including our dogs that we swear reason, associate ideas, which is very, very close, but it isn't the same. So you're dealing with a brain that can't reason, therefore you need to give him a, a, a consistency and, if you like it, a framework within which to work. You and I can put our alarms on, get up, clean our teeth, get dressed, make a plan. The horses, the other mammals can't do that. We have to make that plan for them. We have to put them into a framework, if you like it, of discipline. And mine is very simple. They don't stop, they don't run out. They woe when I ask, they go when I ask. And if they push the boundaries on that, I'm going to try and be fair and clear and consistent on that. But within that framework, I want them to be the artist that they were born to be. I want them to enjoy their life. I want them to use whatever bits and funny pieces they have. I don't mind if they're an impressionist or a portrait painter or whatever, but I don't want to be dominating their every move, but they go where I ask, when I ask. And that's what is so fun about rough ground training, which is a real fundamental of cross country. Um, <laughs> just when you're hacking just look to the side see if you can get off your normal route get into the undergrowth be careful there's no wire be careful there's no holes or animal traps god forbid um because when you're off the track you're you're going where nobody else has been so you could fall into danger but you can find so much especially in woods up and down verges be careful of rabbit holes they're always somewhere around or whatever holes you might have in your country um up and down banks, in and out of little ditches, difficult ground, soft ground, be careful in the woods when the grass is very green because that's usually a bog and you might never get out of that and you might frighten your horse so much you never want to go near uh, something watery again. So you have to be, be careful when you're rough ground training because you don't want to create a fright. But what you're doing is you're developing so much hand-eye coordination in your horse. You're developing so much trust that wherever you say to go, it is okay. That's why you must be sure it is okay. And he will start to build up muscle and strength from putting his head down and scrambling up and over this and up and over that. It's all in walk, all on long rein. And you will have the added benefit of actually balancing throughout all these things. And you're still only in walk. And I don't, don't mind if you're a beginning rider or uh, an advanced rider it's still the most fantastic thing to do for your balance for your horse's balance for his coordination and for him learning that fundamental that I don't hear talked about very often now but when I was younger and started cross country the ethos was you've got to develop enough trust in your horse that he can take on and go wherever you ask him to go because he does believe in you and literally he can walk off the edge of the world because you have said it's all right and when you come to the ski jump at Babington which isn't there anymore may come back who knows it is like walking off the edge of the world you turn away from the deer fence that's very close to the ski jump you trot up a little ramp about 10 foot long and on the top of that little ramp is the smallest fence at Babington it was barely one foot high log and the other side all you see are the high branches of the oak trees you see no ground and your horse has to have enough faith and belief in you that he'll trot up that ramp and launch out over that one foot log into he knows not where. 
So to me, that is our fundamental when we're training cross country. It's developing that trust so that horse believes in us and he'll go wherever we ask him to go. So I see a few questions, a few things coming up in the chat. Uh, no, I don't. I see a few things in Q&A, which I'll go to in a minute. But I, I just want to leave you on this particular chat before I answer some of your questions and do pile them in if you've got any. Um, that I do see a lot of problems at clinics. I see a lot of running out. I see a lot of horses that are in front of the leg, don't have the go button. A lot of horses don't have the stop button. Sometimes it's a change of bit. Sometimes it's a change of way of riding. I see so much. I mean, they've come to the clinic, these people all over the world, because they have a problem or because they think they might learn something. Hopefully, um, a little bit of the both may be, but hopefully they will go away learning something. And I am astonished, but it does seem to be the case that this learning online can really help, can really stick. You haven't got the pressure of being on a horse. You're, you, you're at peace, you're at ease. And you say, what did she say? And you can play it back. Whereas in a clinic, you might not dare say, what did she say? Even though I say, please tell me if my ear things aren't working because they all have ear things in so they can hear me more clearly. I mean, it's, it's not always easy or the other side of the field. You didn't hear, you can't ask somebody to say it again. Whereas online you can, and you can do it at your own pace. Whereas in a clinic, you've got a certain amount of, come on, get on with it. We've only got two hours do this, do that, do the other. So you've, you've got, some people respond really well to that sort of, if you like it, pressure, even though we're not horrible to people, we hope. Um, it is, you know, you're with others, you don't want to let people down, you don't want to hold up the clinic. There's all those sort of pressures that are there, which aren't there when, you, when you're when you learning online, which is a really useful thing. And in the academy, we do one video lesson a month, and that's probably the only thing you need to watch, 20, 30, 40 minutes. And then the other Monday evenings, and they're all on the hub, so nobody has to be there on a, on a Greenwich Mean Time Monday evening at eight o'clock. Um, we have question and answer time once a month based on the lesson, the video lesson, which again, you can be driving to ask your questions. And we have two wonderful um, people coming in. One is um, Inside Info, we have the most amazing selection of people, top level riders, top level coaches. We have Management Monday, which can range from anything from fitness for you, fitness for your horse, dentistry, bitting, feeding, management. Management is enormous. Riding, as those of you that are trying to event seriously know only too well, is only a very small part of it. The riding and training, there's so much in the management. So let's have a look. Let's actually get the glasses on that are going to see. And we've got lots in the Q&A, so I'm going to go straight there. Um, so Krista Wilson, my horse has been jumping 0.9 for the past two years. I did a long format. We had some runouts at the steeplechase jumps because I did not practice them enough. Very, very good point about that. Does definitely, the steeplechase is a wonderful phase for teaching you to run and jump, but it needs practice because horses aren't used to coming into big black brush fences, which are often not very wide because they're economizing. Um, and even if they are wide, they get lost and sort of run down them. So I was told very firmly when phase B, the steeplechase was still an important part of eventing, that you must practice and you must go out there and practice jumping a, a brush fence or two or three in a line at speed. Uh, now she stops and runs out at the beginning of the cross country course and it's just once, but of course it ruins the day. Uh, William Foxpit said, it sounds like she's lost her confidence. So I just keep the walk over jumps so we get our confidence back. One time in a clinic with you, we had to walk over a barrel. Should I just break it down to the walk and then build to trot or canter? Yes, walk jumping. <coughs> I, <coughs> they've got to be really small <coughs> to walk jump. And you don't want to cheat and let them trot the last stride because then they're learning to rush. It, it's a reasonable skill walk jumping. And I think I'd probably head straight for trot, but not too fast. I always say rise slowly so that you don't get your horse going too fast and have to pull because when you pull, the head goes up and they don't see the fence and then they stop. And I would wagon her, if it's a her, yes it is, into your first two or three fences in trot. Um, 
in, don't start in a 90, go, go to a 70 or an 80 and just get kicking in those. Don't start kicking too early. Only when she asks a question and you know when she asks a question because she'll slow down and she'll drop, try and drop behind your leg. That's the point when you get your ready for trouble seat and you sit back and you kick until she's jolly landed. Um, and you have no, there's no, there's no, there's no option. You just have your chin stuck out and your shoulders stuck back and you, you get the job done and she has to learn that she goes. They learn very quickly that they don't have to do it. And that's where I think the uncertainty comes in and then that starts to turn to lack of confidence. But that lack of confidence can also become like a child, can also become quite naughty. Um, and habit forms very, very quickly, uh, uh, and avoiding offence forms very quickly. So Paula Art says mine is disabled as well. I'm not quite sure what that means, not being techie, but maybe Rachel will be onto that. She'll be in the background here. Madeline, my mare is very brave in terms of the fences, but can be nappy. So he loses the go button. She stopped halfway around a course to spook at something and then took a minute or so to get going and then jumped everything else to finish the course. Any tips to keep her focused? Uh, I, I'm going to be really boring here because there's masses you can do to keep her focused, but you follow the green print and, and you join the academy. I know it's a proper, proper rotten answer, isn't it? It's not helping you at all, but that happens. A lot of young horses do that and you need to have different ways of dealing with it. So your chat is disabled. Okay, so Rachel, I don't know whether that's normal, but everybody that is wanting to ask something, just click on to q and A, it's fine. So my mare does this too, says Holly, she jumps four fences then stops to where near a fence and refuses to move schooling, she is fabulous. Yeah, I think that freezing is a nightmare and my strongest recommendation is to go uh, to some sort of hunter trial or some sort of competition because it's the atmosphere of the competition that freezes you a bit so that also thread through to your horse and she's not used to quite the feeling she's getting from you because you're more nervous because you're in a competition try and go to a competition where they have pairs and if they don't have it try and encourage it in your area unaffiliated competitions you can't have a british eventing event in pairs unfortunately the other thing in england we have uh, in uk actually it's all over um is team chasing and that's really helpful provided the lead horse of the team is a goer then you can take the lead for a bit. And if you start to freeze, the lead horse can come past you and get you going. And hunting of any description, which happens in many parts of the world, is a wonderful way just to get them to learn that when you say go, they have to go. Uh, Alison Wallace's chat is disabled too. So I'm writing notes, which I can't do writing. Exactly, that's the point. You're so right. That's the point of learning online. You, you can write notes. You can learn at the speed and in the manner you want. Some people are visual. Some people are cranial, whatever the word is. I'm not a psycho, so I don't know. But there's so many different ways of learning that I, I am aware of. So Stacey says, my 12-year-old daughter is getting ready for her first one-day event in Loch Moy, where I shall be in uh, golly, quite soon. Um, quite soon after your clinic, uh, after your competition at Lockmoy, I'm teaching there just before Kentucky later in April. If you could go back and give yourself advice before your first event, what would you say? I'll tell you what I was given, the best advice I could ever wish to be given anywhere. My father, at the start of Babington, so we'd been through a lot, gripped my knee and said, just remember, old girl, you do it for fun. There's nothing fun about standing in that start box almost at any event, let alone badminton, when you have absolutely no idea if either you or your horse are up to the task. But it's something to remember when all the bad times come, of which there are many. There's probably two steps back and one step forward, and I always reckon that nine out of ten yucky times one out of ten good time and it's one out of ten good time that keeps us going but it is worth remembering why we do it it's not to impress the world it's not to flash our friends it's because we love our horses and we love the challenge that cross country presents our horses and us and really the challenge it presents our partnership and that's what I find so wonderful about it I love to feel I've done my homework I've found my horse's confidence I therefore have found that he believes in himself and therefore I can believe in him. And it's that challenge that cross country examines and I love it for that. Um, so have fun at Lock Moy. 
So Tally, my chat is disabled too. Question with a very green horse whom you don't want to scare. Is it okay to let them look at a jump before they step over? Now, I would have always said no, but I was training uh, the other day at Tweezledown and Kirsty Shabe had some horses there and she had various um, pupils on them and they were all looking at their fences, going up, smelling them, turning around, trotting over them. And so I asked her about it and she said, yes, I, do. I always do that. So I thought, I think I need to change my views a bit on that because I always used to say, no, they need to not know what it is and just learn that they've got to take it in in a millisecond and get over it. If they're only walking or trotting, they have got lots of milliseconds. But I, I saw somebody else doing it the other day. And, and so I'm thinking, OK, don't let's make too big a thing of it. But if we think there is something really scary, why not walk up and smell it? My reason for not was because I felt that any time a horse saw a fence, he must realise that he was to get to the other side. So have both those thoughts in your mind. Um, and I, I wouldn't go strong on either one. Uh, Joanne, my mare also gets distracted between the fences. Yes, I'm sorry, join the academy. And there is so much to work on on that. Um, tips for a spooky horse, please. It's all the same that we're talking about. And I'm afraid I shall give the warm bloods a bash here because I very rarely had spooky horses because nearly all my horses were much more thoroughbred than they were anything else, probably seven eighths. And I have found the warm blood is a much spooky animal and I have no idea why. Andrew McLean, who's done much on our academy and is in the hub if anybody wants to listen to him, he wonders if it's something to do with the way the uh, angle of the lenses are set in the eye. I have another theory, I have a Darwinian theory that for the last, let's say, 300 years since thoroughbreds became thoroughbreds and turned into racehorses as well as other things, the warm blood has been trotting along, pulling a carriage with blinkers. And even if he didn't have blinkers, he wasn't going very fast. So he didn't learn about the world and the way the thoroughbred did is he zipped past everything in, in flat out gallop. And so I think the warm blood is definitely a much spookier horse. And <clears throat> my daughter, Lissa, has quite a lot of them now because they're the fashion at the moment uh, with only a little bit of thoroughbred, although she tries to get a horse with as much thoroughbred as possible because they have so much more stamina, they have such a quick thinking brain, they're so much easier to train really, uh, thoroughbreds or near thoroughbreds. Um, and she will always get them to go up to a thing they're spooking at and smell it. And sometimes it takes quite a long time to get them up to it. And this isn't quite the same in a competition because they're spooking for miles away at something that they see or spooking suddenly at a pram and a person pushing the pram that they're passing. And you just have to try and hold your line. And sometimes you have to turn your horse away from what it's spooking and push it towards it with your with the other leg. So if you just keep pulling it towards what it's spooking at as it's gradually drifting left, you keep pulling right. You open the shoulder to drift further and further left. So if you can, it takes a bit of strength though, especially if you're going faster, they can use that speed to spook more. Try and turn them away, away from the object they're spooking at and push them into it. If I've got a bad spook, I will stop dead because I cannot handle, I haven't got the strength to handle a horse that's moving. When he's spooking, he'll just move further and further away. So I will stop dead. And if I'm in a competition, I probably won't go over and look at it because we've got to get going. But I won't just keep on letting him move sideways. I'll stop him. And you'll find that that will help a lot. Um, Paula, I have an older retired dressage horse enjoying an active retirement. I'm teaching him how to do small jumps. I'm going to correct you on that because he knows how to do small jumps. We think we teach our horses, but they all know how to jump. We're just presenting a situation that they haven't had before, especially if they've been dressage horses. And I bet he loves it. The amount of horses I've had in clinics that have not enjoyed dressage and have started putting the anchors on in dressage, who just love the challenge of jumping small jumps and then as they get their confidence those jumps get bigger he's almost unmanageable outside the arena or even in the outside arena looking for tips how to manage that currently trying to lunge him outside looking for other ideas golly it's a hard one that not seeing him but i don't know what country you're in but uh england's getting a bit better now but america has got a little bit of a habit of massively overfeeding their horses there was a time when the nutritionists of feed companies 
were encouraging you to feel, feed more starch in order to give your horse the energy he needed. But he only really needs that energy for higher levels. For lower levels, he, he can get enough energy through a bit of oil. He doesn't need too much of that sometimes. And certain horses really have to exist just on hay. And I think Ginny Elliott, Ginny Leng, Ginny Holgate, the genius of her age, however you remember her by whichever name, she used to train her horses up until intermediate and they looked correspondingly quite thin and not particularly glamorous on hay and not highly proteinated hay, high energy hay, uh, sugar beet, soaked sugar beet, grass meal. And that was giving them enough energy to do the job, but not enough energy to be an idiot. And I used to say to her, because she was a great friend, you know, your horses look so incredible when they get to intermediate, they get to Babbitt and they just are the picture of everybody's eye, rather like Nicky Henderson's, those of you that follow steeplechasing at Cheltenham. And um, Willie Mullins's are probably a bit more like Ginny's were before they got to intermediate, a bit sleeker, a bit, bit, a bit skinnier. And yet w Willie Mullins and Nicky Henderson vie for top trainers place all over, all over the countries. Um, and Ginny said, yes, I can't, I'm so small. I can't handle a young horse who hasn't yet been educated, hasn't yet been trained, if he's if he's too robust and too energetic. So I have to cut the food. And yes, they don't look great, but by the time they've got their framework of discipline around them and they understand what it is I'm trying to do and they're starting to love it with me instead of against me, then I can start to feed them. And boy, those horses look the best. And I think Willie Mullins, I went over and spent a morning with him not so long ago. And, um, he has... 30, 40 horses at a time, each lot. And they're walking around in cold weather, wind, January, rain, whatever, and they don't have exercise blankets. And he's often delayed in the office doing something important. And so those horses learn to toughen up by actually getting cold, but it doesn't take away their desire to win. It's quite fascinating how the two ends of the scale, Nick is looking really well, Willie's looking a little bit on the skinny side and both of them win. So that leaves you <laughs> wondering what to do, but just don't overfeed your horses that are not performing and doing what you ask them to do or just being over the top. I don't know if that helps, but have a good look at your feeding and basically hay and a few horse and pony nuts, what you feed the kid's pony when you don't want it to be mad. And we feed just a chaff and a balancer. The balancer gets the basic uh, minerals, vitamins in. And, and they have whatever hay they want and, and they, they survive really well on that until they start doing a bit more. Right, so Maureen, my mare threw me badly due to pain. She think you've got pain now too. She has had surgery and we are rehabilitating her, but my confidence is shattered. I can believe that. I hunt my other horse without a thought. What can I do to build our confidence again in each other? It's so difficult that, and it so often is confidence applicable to just one horse that you don't trust anymore. And you've got to build that trust up and you do it however you think. If you do it by being on a leading rein from somebody else whilst you ride him. If you do it by putting a Western saddle on, which are virtually unfallable outable, but that might be too heavy. Um, a stock saddle in Australia might be too heavy. They are very heavy, but you don't fall out of them very easily. Just think outside the box because there's no magic formula. And I learned this with Lissa when she had her first really bad fall. And she was probably, what, 16. And up until then, she had no idea what fear was. She was so brave. She'd had it very early in her life when her pony ran away when she was about four or five. And that took a long time to come back from. And, and that was just only riding when she wanted to, making sure the pony didn't run away again. And just gradually, she wanted to ride more and more. But it was no pressure. And it's the same with you. If you really want to ride this horse that's had the operation, you probably need to get somebody on it who's experienced to make sure it isn't going to do the same thing again, because muscle memory is quite a strong thing. So I'd be inclined to ask somebody else to start her off or him off. And then you've got to think outside the box as to how you feel you can get going. Um, play with him, do lots in hand or her, but it's a, it's a getting on that's the problem and what the pain of maybe it was, I don't know if it was kissing spine or what, caused a problem. But I would advise you to go to somebody else who's a bit more of a, a rider who used to horses doing funny things because it is frightening and it's wonderful and absolutely wonderful. Your confidence is still totally good with your other horse. I mean, that should give you great hope that you'll get back with this one. Gary, my fella has struggled with his confidence since I got him since I got him and he's very spooky bags of talent but I keep getting told he needs to just get hardship 
I, but I keep getting told he needs to get hardship to get going. Yes, that, that phrase, when the going gets tough, the tough get going. I don't actually think that necessarily applies to horses. However, I suspect from what I'm hearing you say that you're being accused of babying him. And that can be a, that can be no way through confidence. If you've got a child who doesn't want to go into the cave, you don't just hold its hand in a flimsy way. You take hold of the child's hand and you say, come on, we're going together into this. And you may have a bit of a drag and a bit of a this, and you may have to whip him up off this off the floor and carry him a bit and put him down. And you again, you're thinking outside the box. You're not just saying, oh, please do this with a, a, a wet hand. Come on, you're giving that confidence through to that child. And that's what you've got to do with your horse. And that's why I think you've been told that he needs a bit of hardship to get going. Don't namby pamby be firm don't try and do things that he can't do if you're jumping make sure they're small enough to walk over it, it's it's just teaching him the stop go button it's the green print i'm sorry to bang on about it but it is a green print you've got to have these gears in place these mind gears as well as these physical gears so good luck um tinkle long worth god don't think i can say that word what are your tips for jumping skinnies <clears throat> well, I never start with wings because I want you, the rider, to learn how to keep a horse straight. But I start with very, very small. And <clears throat> first of all, I go through the wings that are just upright wings. They're not giving me any help. They're not wide with a little four foot pole, one meter 20 pole on the ground. Do that both ways in walk, both ways in trot. And if I've got control over canter, both ways in canter. And then I'll put it up and I'll go in slow jog, rising jog. And doesn't matter, under, over or through. I don't care. I never do with skinnies when I'm training. Under, over or through is fine. Round is not allowed. And that's the way I build up. And I never go straight into a solid skinny that um, I, I can't put down if he stops or runs out of it. I want to try, train over blocks so that he doesn't have to go through anything, but it's more difficult to keep him straight over blocks and over things that he has to go through. <clears throat> and they find it so easy once you get over the discomfort that some of them have of finding things so close remember a horse can see nearly 360 degrees not quite he's got incredible vision and that's so that he does he's a fight or flight or fight animal so he needs to be able to get out of the way and he needs to see that lion coming down off a tree be very very careful when you go up into the loft if the loft is overhanging a stable because when he suddenly sees movement up there he can <clears throat> jump out of the way and really hurt himself smash into the wall of the stable Awful story here. Some photographer went to do some proper photographs of a wonderful horse that somebody had and <clears throat> they left him in the stable. He climbed up onto the stable wall, the horse reared up, hit his head and killed himself. And he had to go back into the house to say, oh, your horse is dead. I mean, can you imagine that? So be very aware that horses can see <clears throat> everywhere, except a couple of places very clearly. So that's why some horses are nervous when they come to do things that are only one meter 20 wide. And I don't practice much narrower than that because your kneecaps need a life and they can hurt. Um, Melinda, what a lovely way of spelling Melinda. I'm hoping to build my confidence. Can you give any tips on warm-up strategies for competitions? Join the academy. <laughs> um, Sorry, that wasn't Milan, that was an anonymous attendee. I'm hoping to build my confidence, says Melinda. My new horse is much better, braver than me. But at 50 plus, join the club, plus plus for me. I'm trying to be a little braver about getting back into a vending. Good for you. I'm super excited about doing this program. And you will love it. And I promise you, it will be full of downs, but the ups are worth every minute. And the downs are just part of life. All riding and being with horses does is mirror life and you learn to get through the downs with your horses you get more confidence in yourself you find a more positive attitude comes into your life and yes it runs your bank account dry but it helps your life i think be an awful lot happier um tilda another lovely way of spelling a name my mare started with me after being a show jumper all her life she is 12 on the beginning, she hadn't really problems with any new fences, but one time during our cross country, I accidentally forgot my way, don't we all? And we lost rhythm right before the little coffin. Oh, bad luck. She jumped the part A, but stopped in front of the ditch and I fell off from that time. She refused jumping ditches and she was really nervous near me, near them. And no matter how hard I am trying to not let her stop, she always does it. And I don't know what to do. And 
I can hear so exactly what's happening. I cannot tell you here how to help because it is manifest, manifold. You must join the Academy. And I know I keep saying this, but this is why I'm here, because I want to help exactly what problems you have. I also want to help those that have already got over this stage and are planning on going intermediate, advanced, because the fundamentals are the same. And sometimes if you miss a fundamental on the way up, if you miss a scale of training, you pay for it. And two years down the road, something goes wrong, maybe like you stopping the ditch in the coffin, and you have to wheel back and get those basic fundamentals in place. It's like a car. It cannot operate without all the bits of its engine. So this is not just for people who are starting out, but the same theory covers everything because the fundamentals never change and they go right through to the very top of the tree. So Tilda, hope we'll see you. Uh, Ellen, when are you coming back to San Diego, California? Too far at the moment. Um, I do fly through there on the way to New Zealand, Australia. And I, I did actually this time make a, um, an inquiry, a friend of mine who runs uh, clinics in San Francisco for me, but it didn't work time-wise. There was too much water on the ground. So I have it in my mind when I'm next coming out to Australia, New Zealand, where I have a son and two grandchildren in New Zealand. So I try to come once or twice a year to drop off on the West Coast. Um, oh, good, Stacey. See you at Lockmoy. We're auditing. Well, hopefully you'll enjoy what you see or listen to as audit means listen. Um, and hopefully you'll be there on your horse in a year or so whenever I come back. Tilda, my mayor is also, I think, scared of water. She always has to stop the first and sniff it. But when we have a fence right between the, the waters, she won't jump it. Yeah. Uh, just remember that water and ditches are instinctively, prehistorically, places not to go. If you were a horse thousands of years ago and you got stuck in a bog, there was no earth mover to pull you out. In, in um, Ireland hunting, those ditches that make the banks are sometimes 12 foot deep with streams running through the bottom and sometimes a horse slips into them and they have to be got out with, with a tractor and a rope. So there was none of that. They died in the wilds. And if they fell into a chasm, they died. So their instincts in some horses are very, very strong not to go near water, not to go near ditches. And it's up to us, and that's why you need to join the academy and learn about the green print, to train our horses to believe that we are more trustworthy than their instincts. We're trying to override their instincts. And as I say, some horses' instincts are way stronger than others. Some horses just don't worry about going through a puddle. Others are horrified. And talking about puddles, when you get a nice rainy day and we have lots of those, build a jump before a puddle. Build a jump in the middle of the puddle. Build a jump the other side of the puddle. And, and tiny jump, walk over it and get a friend to come with you with their gumboots on so they can put it back up again. There's so much you can do to create cross-country practices without a cross-country course. So, Rachel, my horse has an incredible sense of self-preservation. Well, that's good. I'm much happier to ride a horse with an incredible sense of self-preservation than I am one without. Um, fantastic for show jumping, very careful, cause issues across country when fences get bigger, more complex. I need to give him time to look and figure out the more complex fences maintain the power. Is this where the coffin canter might help? 100%. You have, in a nutshell, said what you have to do across country. You have to give a horse time to read a fence as he gets more confident. He can read it quicker. I always say a young horse is akin to a child learning to read a book. The cat sat. And an advanced horse is equivalent to the use and eyes, but not I, that can speed read a paperback in 40 minutes. They can think so quickly once they've had that mind and that body trained. And that takes years. And you might have to start with a 12 year old horse and it'll then take him at least 16 before he's really sharp. He'll probably be a little quicker than a young horse whose brain is still like a child's and still developing. So yes, I like what you're saying. Coughing canter needs a lot of practice. The best place to practice coughing canter is downhill because you will want the horse to carry himself and not lean on you and pull you down and to realize just how much it takes how much of your balance, your leg has to be doing the right thing. And it's an experiment with your horse, what you do. But learning to canter downhill is a huge benefit for helping them achieve coughing canter. Um, I'm just looking down here to see the amount of questions. We've got 15 more minutes before the hour is up and I will go on answering, but I see 36 now, it was 24 a minute ago. So I'm just gonna plod through these, not plod, because I really enjoy answering them. 
but I'm not going to answer them too fully because I think I am at fault here. I'm taking too long. Shona, excited to make the Cross Country Academy this year. While we're not concerned about any specific area, we're hoping to move up from training to modify prelim, which is novice in, in Great Britain and prelim in America. Is there any thoughts, advice to where the Academy can help with and what you can advise to remember to keep my chin up and brave? Um, great that you're coming to win green. We will see you there. Do ask that question there and I'd love to answer it more fully. But you will find when you get to find your way around the, the, the Academy Hub, you'll find the answers to your questions are already there uh, in certain people's speaks. And we are also starting a new thing, um, cross-country training for success or whatever it is, I can never remember the title. And we're plotting to put everything into monthly um for six months into monthly increments so that you don't get met with this hub of information which some of you love going through and others do if you if you're like me you'll go oh i need some direction so we're giving you some direction so hopefully you can get a bit from that but i'm thrilled that you're moving up to prelim and look forward to seeing you in just a couple of weeks time a few weeks time in virginia america so, essay. What do you suggest to start a young horse over cross country? A bit of everything, or compass bully little fences. Definitely things that don't fall down. Little logs, little roll tops, little gates. Anything small. You don't want to have to keep getting off and putting them back up. If they hit them, they want to learn that that hurts and that they best to get their legs out of the way. They very, very quickly learn. And quite often, if you're just walking over little things, they'll just step one leg and then another. Quite often you're walking over little ditches, they'll just go in and out and maybe they'll trip or stumble, I don't care. But once they're trotting, they usually jump and they usually jump the ditches too. So just solid fences, I'd much rather not start in the arena. I'd much rather not start with a, a jump that knocks down. I don't want them to get the hang of that too early. Um, Alison, when I get what I get stuck on moving up the levels was making the time as we started jumping bigger tracks, we couldn't get there. What are your tips for good fitness, please? Sorry, there's so much of that on the academy, and there's so so much about fitness. But remember the speed element in the air, start going so they land moving. You can pick up a second on every straightforward fence like that. And fitness, try to do something that expands their lungs every four days um that's the sort of base outline that i can help you with sebastian five-year-old irish draft sport horse cross sport horse he has grown a lot and got big in all dimensions i ride him in a snaffle when doing flat work but when i jump in a snaffle he gets too big think i do know the feeling thinking about a stronger bit as he just gets too strong for me and pulls me away in the speed he wants what would you suggest thank you okay this looks like it's from slovenia i love it and i love irish drafts too i love the mix irish draft thoroughbred irish drafts on their own can be superb too but they can just sometimes lack a turn of foot for the higher levels but some of them are really quite fine beautiful Irish drafts and I, a friend of mine who, who is master of the me the hunt I think is field master always hunts an Irish draft because they're so clever they're so good in the brain they're so powerful as you find so um they also take a long time to mature and the ones that I've had at eight nine ten before they've even really got their feet under them so it's a long job five is really young especially for an Irish draft thoroughbreds probably mature quicker um Waterford, which is a bobbly bit, is a really useful bit. Uh, it's quite a kind bit because it doesn't nutcracker like the snaffle. And a lot of horses, instead of boring through, will respond to it. But then because it's quite kind, they sometimes can just nip off in it. Um, but I try different snaffles, Dr. Bristles, the plate one way, the plate another way. Um, there's, a, there's a nicer way and a less nice way. Um, I usually go doc I usually go Waterford. I sometimes go Waterford gag, but I'll always start with two reins because sometimes horses don't just like the one bottom rein of the gag. Um, Pelham's never say never to anything, <clears throat> never say never to the dreaded three ring, but out of a nine out of ten horses come to a clinic in the three ring, only one out of those ten likes it, the rest hate it. So it's not a go-to bit for me, but some horses go in it, some horses go in a Pelham, again, not a go-to bit for me because a lot of them will lean, but some of them can be brilliant. Bitting is really trial and error, and there's a whole heap about that on the academy too. Uh, Jess, onto skinnies, have you had to deal with training a horse with one eye with skinnies? Yep, my mare was born with one eye. That's amazing, was she? And the Biggest thing that stopped us cross country consistently has been skinnies, but I feel her eye or lack of is possibly a legitimate problem. 
could be, couldn't it? She, of course, doesn't have the confidence, but not sure if I'm asking her for something that will always be beyond her capabilities. Jess, I'm going to suggest that you roll back because this will be recorded and will be sent out. I don't know where, but Techie Rachel will tell us. Um, because you need to listen to what I said about how to train over skinnies and you need to go right back with her. I have trained horses with one eye. I've seen them at Olympic Games with one eye. And those that have been able to see with two now only got one. The horse that won the derby at Hicks did, lost his eye two years before he won the derby. And he came round to the Devil's Dyke, the most difficult fence on the Hickstead Derby course, which is show jumping, with his blind eye facing it and facing away because he was pulling so hard. And he jumped through it clear and he won. So that I don't think you should be too worried, but I think you're very right to be aware that his particular eyesight in the other eye may not be enough to compensate for the, for the no eye. But if he was born with it, I think you've got much more chance than those that go without after they've learned to have two. I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm just having a guess at it, but give it a go. Um, now, why isn't my thing going up? There we are. Miranda have started to have the most amazing transformation. My three youngsters and older horses and ponies by following your green print stages. This is karma, <laughs> K-A-R-M-A, or however you spell it, because I have not asked you to put this on. And I am getting close to the end of this webinar. And you have just said something so wonderful that you've started and found the most amazing transformation in your three youngsters and older horses and ponies by following your green print stages here in Uganda. And I missed you because I was in Botswana not so long ago and Kenya. We have been a teaching in Botswana too, holidaying on the safari on horses in Kenya. There is no better cross country lesson for the rider than Kenya offbeat safaris, brilliant. The jumps are made by the elephants that knock down trees and eat a bit of bush and then leave. It can be really small, quite big, but it is the most wonderful practice. So we call the course designer in Kenya, E. Le Fon, P-H-A-N-T. Um, I'm so glad you're having so much fun and that your riders are braver and you have happier horses. And that clearly you're telling me is thanks to the Academy and the Green Prince. So I'd like to leave it on that, but I still have eight more minutes. So we will keep going. Thank you. Um, is it okay to start at the same level as finish the season before? If anything, go down a level when you start. Because if you if you finish at intermediate, it can be quite shocking to come out when you've been in a, possibly in an arena all winter and maybe not been able to get out on the turf much. It, I think Dickie Wagard said it so well, when a horse is used to an all-weather surface and he suddenly gets onto a cross-country course on turf, it's like we, those of us lucky enough to go skiing, it takes us a bit of time to get our ski legs. And when you've been on a boat for a long time and you get onto dry land, wobbling a bit, it takes you a bit of time to get your land legs. So I think, um, don't worry if you start a level down, I think, and, and try and get onto grass. Not easy, the farmers are screaming at us, but try and get off that arena. And if you haven't got one, honestly, you're lucky. Um, I know it's a challenge when the ground is really, really wet, but if it's really wet, like here in New Zealand, it's actually washed a whole lot of arenas clean away and houses are having a terrible time north of where I am in New Zealand. Houses silt up to here in them when the, when the rivers went down, ruined. Insurance nightmare, there's so much claiming. Um, Pity, I was at 100 last year, I'm only 12, so I can I go novices? Yeah, you are asking the wrong person, Kitty. I don't know the rules. Look it up online because you'll be better online than I'll ever be. Uh, I'm pretty sure you're okay and good luck and make sure you enjoy it. Now is the time to really love it. Gary, and any plans to come to Ireland for clinic? Now I keep getting um, emails from various people um, and we've just, you know, really kind people who say, please come, please come. And I, I sort of don't go, don't make a date and forget. So if anybody's really keen, then, then get emailing me. Um, uh, but I haven't got a lot of time, but I love Ireland um, and the Irish. Uh, Catherine, my schoolmaster is 13 year old, great at 80, 90, but took exception to the new Tweezle down ditch near the car park trolls. Oh, I'm trying to think which that is. Um, there's a really difficult ditch down the bottom, nowhere near the car park trolls. Um, anyhow, let me continue reading because Tweezle down is raged all my partner in crime in this academy. Uh, it's her place, so we spend a lot of time there. Um, are you doing other tools down or southeast clinics? I very occasionally do 
and clinic in England, and it's usually on the community. There's a, an open Facebook, Lucinda Green Cross Country Facebook community or something, or Lucinda Green Cross Country community. And I try and put the dates if I am ever doing anything on there, but I don't always remember. Uh, but the Academy will help you without an absolute shadow of doubt. You need to get in there and work out how to do ditches and rebuild the confidence. Uh, Rachel, how do I build my confidence back up after a bad fall? Difficult. My horse is on 12 week rehab program for his deep digital flexor tendon. And I wonder if he did that in the fall. Tried hacking in walk at the weekend and he reared up and I fell off. That's so bad. You poor girl. I'm so sorry for you. Hoping to get him back out for some cross country training fun in the summer holidays. Yeah, it's difficult when they've been on rehab because they haven't been doing any work. So, you know, even if you fed them just bangers and mashes, I call it just, just hay and more hay and a balancer. They're, they're cooped up, they're, they're not well. You probably aren't allowed to let him out in the field in case he ruins the mending of his deep flexor. It is difficult. So so we tend to lead them when, they're, when they've been, I uh, haven't got a lot of control leading, but we don't want to get on them either much. Um, rearing is something, Andrew McLean, if you join the academy, get on that hub and do, do, do listen to Andrew McLean while you're driving somewhere. It's an art. And he's brilliant with rearing. And he said to me, it's not a problem rearing. I said, it's the worst thing and I don't know what to do with it. He said, all you do is they're going up. You whip them around in a very tight circle. You knock them off balance two or three times, two or three circles. And he said, they very soon give up rearing because they're frightened of falling over. If you wait until they've got to the top and then try and pull them around, you might pull them over. That's why people are taught to hug their horse. But what does that mean to the horse? Every time he goes up, he gets a hug. Well, that's gonna make him go on going up, get another hug association of ideas they don't reason so whip them around it works every time but you've got to be you've got to be on it you've got to be able to be quick to react which is what cross country is all about developing quicker and quicker and quicker reactions so the, here's a good start but i'm really sorry for you because you've been hurt and and you've fallen off again and that that's really really horrid for you uh again join join the academy and you'll ha hit off so many people in a similar situation to you on the facebook which is just destined only for the academy members Tilda, any plans to visit Poland for a clinic? Nobody's asked me. I think um, maybe you have or somebody has, but we never got round to a date. Um, I think it's probably an economic problem um, in Poland because it's quite expensive to get me there and then to pay me each day. It isn't cheap and I don't know that the economies are that good and I just feel so much for you all with poor Ukraine on your doorstep. Oh. Jackie Smith here. Oh, that's my mate, Jackie, who's held more clinics for me in Ohio than I think almost anybody bar Pam Wiedemann, who's held them since the onset with Arthur Tatishi in, in Canada, who started out with the whole business of clinics in America and then found Pam wanting one down in America rather than in Canada and down we went. And Jackie, you've probably fast fallen into place behind Pam has been the one who's held the most. So here she says, we really miss you here in Ohio. I'm doing a winter lesson series with a wonderful large indoor. Uh, and last weekend lesson was modeled after day one of your clinic. Yes, that's what I want. I want people to take away all that I can offer because I'm not going to be here forever. You know, I'm going to be in that coffin one day and then you've all got to take over from me. That's why I want you to join the community of, of our academy because you will learn so much it was a great weekend says jackie with horses and riders improving tremendously this is so exciting and having so much fun along the way that is the key we gotta have fun any chance we can get you back again when would we would love to have you but for now good to see and hear you Mwah, jackie i so miss you and your wonderful family your husband is a vet you've got two cracking boys as sons and one of them rides really well and they actually they both ride really well just one of them's doing something different a little bit now so i would love to come back and i did possibly have a space um oh jesus i can't remember when but it's um quite soon i don't know whether you can put one on in three weeks but i'm not sure of that space now because i'm, I'm toing and throwing with somebody else Oh, goodness me, it's because you're not quite next door to Florida, Ohio. <laughs> and that's where I am in, in a couple of weeks. Lovely to hear from you, Jackie. Thank you so much for coming on. It is 10 o'clock and I am, despite the fact that I've still got the figure 38 on q and I am going to stop now and I'm going to get Rachel to come in and just do a bit of techie chat. It won't be more than a minute because we know how much you hate that. And I'm not going to answer any more questions yet. So hi, Rachel. And I think I've nearly gone too long because I think you told me to leave at least 10 minutes <laughs> for your techie chat.
<laughs> so this is this is the, the strong part of the academy because she not only did she ride in the Barcelona Olympics and was the first one to get into a massively difficult water jump there, uh, but she is then went off course for horses and went techie and now she's right back on horses and techie. So over to you, Rachel. Oh well, for once we always I always joked with Lucinda. I was I'm I can sell Lucinda until the cows come home because she's just phenomenal. She's taught my daughter to ride and transformed her cross country and um and i'm so glad she agreed to do this academy with uh, with me um and i think lucinda you'll agree that you're glad you did now aren't you she's not listening <laughs> i'm just reading my text from ohio <laughs> i love it and i tell you one of the things i love is that i don't have to see so many airplanes because when <laughs> covid came i had 2.5 years of not flying and because I, I actually love flying because I find it absolutely fascinating that, that huge, great thing can lift off the ground. Yeah. It still scares me. <laughs> but it is, you know, you don't have a life because you're always going somewhere. And I've now taken a thing of I'm not going to give anybody a date until six weeks before. I'm fed up with my diary being filled for a whole year because it stops your life moving. So I love the academy because it's enabled me to back off a bit of all oh, this traveling. Mm. And you can do it wherever you are in the world as well. That's the other brilliant thing about it. So, you see, Nancy, uh, I am I'm taking my jersey off in a minute. <laughs> so, well, so all I want to say is, number one, sorry about the chat, everybody, because um, I was trying to frantically Google and figure out what to do with the chat, and all I had to do was open it and turn it on. <laughs> So she is very exactly. very good normally. oh my god <laughs> anyway that was my learning for today um and uh i have actually in the chat put the link to sign up if anybody's interested but i'll also email it to you and we're doing a big big launch campaign so there's lots of emails coming through um and we'd love to see we've we've actually had loads sign up today which is amazing and um really excited now i just also do want to explain because lucinda you didn't quite make it very clear about six weeks of something i can't remember you said <laughs> well six six months. Months. yeah <laughs> yeah so yes you want. go ahead i do want to explain that so we have a lot of um, content now after two and a half years, so much content. And it and it's so it can be really overwhelming when you join the academy. You're like, God, where do I start? Where do I start? So what we've done is we've divided it into Lucinda's system as such. And it's six stages. Stage one is the green print. Two is ready for trouble and rough ground training. Three, I did type this on your phone for you, Lucinda. <laughs> Three is foundation obstacles. Um, so water, ditches, banks, that type of thing. Four is technical, score, uh, corners, skinnies, um, combinations. Five is speed and six is compete. And we, we take you through that month by month for the first six months. Um, there's still tons more um, on all of those topics in the academy, but we can, we just want to get you through those um, six stages, and that really gets you up to speed. You get you know the lingo, and you have a really good, clear understanding of Lucinda's fundamentals, which thread through everything. There is never a lesson where straight line halt isn't mentioned, or the stop go button, or engine line balance. All of the all of the green print principles, they thread through all of the lessons. It doesn't matter whether you're going to badminton or whether you're doing your first um, 60 centimeter event. Exactly the same. Um, so that's about it, really. I just did want to clear that up so people understood. If anybody has any questions, I'm really happy to um, answer them. I'll just check the chat here. Uh, oh, okay. it might be on Q&A because that's what they've been using. You might have to whiz down to the bottom. Okay, do yeah, I'll have a little look. I doesn't look like there's any more. Um, you can is see what better... fun Rachel and I have because we're sorry to, to cut across you while you're looking, oh. Rachel. But uh, we do have such fun because we've both got our strength and sure as hell we've both got our weaknesses and we know each other's very well. And <laughs> well, we oh, sadly we, we both have, have a lot of fun. Yeah, we do. We have, we do. And uh, we are quite similar in a lot of ways as well, which isn't yeah. always a good thing. <laughs> it's, it's good because then we can understand each other's quirks. Yes. But anyhow, we, we yeah. do have, we share the passion. Yeah. Rachel runs a lot of really good events at Tweezledown and we share the passion 
to keep cross country as the heartbeat of the sport. And we've got work to do. Yeah. We're facing frangible logs, polystyrene logs hollowed out and filled with polystyrene. We're facing that as a possibility. You may say, good, then it'll break and I won't fall off. But who's going to hold an event that has to hollow out all their logs and put polystyrene in? It's just not going to happen. It's, it's too expensive. Uh, I mean, I, I will also say on the confidence side of things, I, I came back to riding after a very long break with a young um, gawky horse. And I and so we, I did quite a lot of the filming and was taught by Lucinda. And I, I was quaking in my boots a little bit to start with. Well, a lot to start with. But using the green print, as in that is your sort of overarching training over everything. But it isn't just that. It's when you come out to a schooling when usually you think, right, I need to be cantering over these fences and so on and so forth. I used to just go through the green print, all of the green print exercises with Eddie and then build my confidence, build his, get that sort of trust between you, that immediate trust. And then I felt like I could do anything. And for me, that was really powerful because I think I always struggled a little bit, even, you know, getting to the level that I did with going schooling and actually having a bit of a plan and knowing what I was doing. And this is exactly what that gives you. I can see a little lesson here, a little um, question from Alison Wallace. So can you log on at any time? I work shifts, I so can't always do lives. Most people can't make the lives, um, Alison. So what happens is we do the live. If it's a QA and a and you know you're not going to make the live, you just send your question in ahead and then I ask it Um of Lucinda, and then I upload it into the hub, and then you can watch it anytime. It's really good. Oh, you can listen to it. You can download it and listen to it as an audio file. Um, so most people do it that way. That said, we usually have 50 or 60 or 70 or 80 sometimes on, on our Q&As, but we have got um, quite a few in the academy now, so that's really good. Um, Okay, Joe is saying, is the academy closed now? Um, I've been on the wait list and I think for a while I'd love to. Now, yes, it's just opened, Joe. So we have emailed. So hopefully you're getting your, your emails. If you're not, then check your spam. Um, so it is open. I put the link in the chat, but also I'm going to be sending some emails over the next uh, three, four days because it's open until Sunday. Um, she said, I'd love to. It's Joe who came third on your Avengers Challenge. Oh, hello, Joe. Hello. <laughs> That's brilliant. Um, Lucinda has ridden her horse too. Oh, hang on. Okay, yes, I know. I know exactly who you are, Joe. Yes. <laughs> so, oh, yeah, brilliant. So it is open to join now. And um, please sign up. Um, and then there's another little note here, Lucinda, from Kate. Um, Sheltima, Sheltima, um, from Green Gables Farm. Uh, she said, if Ohio want the date, oh, would you contact me? I'm in Michigan. Does that make sense? Uh, uh, Jackie, if you're listening still, <clears throat> there's somebody in Michigan that if you get a date wants, so you need to contact Jackie Smith of Stone, golly, what is your name? What is your Stone? It, they have an event there, Stone Something Farm, wonderful event. Jackie Smith, contact her because if it is going to be run and it may not be because I've, I'm just reading that this other one looks like it's happening hmm. uh, in Florida. Um, then Jackie will will make sure you um, you know when it is. So Stone Bridge, I think, her, but there, there is an event there. So if you have a, a look at the calendar of uh, affiliated events, you'll find that one near yeah. So so said, I've just looked. I've just looked. There's a whole bunch of people from here, I think, that have signed up. That's amazing. Here we go. Who are we from? Going? Oh, from the academy. From, yes, from, from the webinar. Yeah, from the webinar. Catherine Marshall, David Moir. Um, is there anything else? That, because other people don't have to listen to how, who signed up. Is, oh, well, is there anything? People like to hear their name read out, though. Oh, okay. But then that's so they've already signed up. Oh, well. <laughs> no, you're quite right. People do like to, to hear oh. their name, but we don't want to bore anybody else. Is, is there any other? There's no other questions. There's no other questions. I mean, I might just give you, well, we've still got quite a few people on. I'll just give you a little bit of a rundown of what happens in the academy. So we've got. Um, each Monday, Lucinda said, on the first Monday, it's a video learning. So that's your video um, lesson for the month. Then we have the Insider Info, who we have unbelievable guests. We've had 
Tim and Janelle Price most, more recently. We've had uh, Dickie Wagard, Chris Bartle, uh, Eric Winter, um, D D D Laura Collett. Uh, I mean, so many, so many. Um, and then the Q&As with Lucinda are always brilliant. She does a, a roundup on the video learning, which is invaluable, and then answers all your questions. And then the last one is the Mindset and Management Monday. And we had a really amazing guy on, David Marlin, last month, who you guys have got to listen. I will put that probably, put that talk in the um, uh, in the six stages to success because um, then you can make sure you watch it. That was amazing. He covered all sorts of topics, nutrition, saddlery. Um, there was loads. I got, oh, you know. Tendons, ice legs, icing, icing. I mean, he he is amazing. He's amazing. I listen to. I don't often listen to the, these amazing people that I have on uh, because I'm too busy and I don't do enough. When I'm driving, I'm on the telephone. Shouldn't be, should I? But um, anyhow, I listen to David Marlin five times. <laughs> That's how it was. It's also because I'm in New Zealand and I'm on holiday. I'm not working, so I have time. But I went running or walking or whatever, and I listened five times because I kept thinking I need to have this information. It was so good. Yeah, it was good. I know. I think we might get him back on again. Um, Helen Kirby, I've just logged in. Has already have an account from last year. Do I need to join again? So, um, Helen, if you're, I'll write your name down. Um, so you shouldn't need to if you've been paying all this time. So. I'll check. I'll check and I'll I'll, I'll message you. Um, I've written your name down. K I R B Y. Yeah. Um, so that's the that's your sort of monthly learning. And then we also do these things called breakout rooms, which I do. I host them and they're brilliant fun. That's where everybody really gets to know each other. Um, you can ask questions of your fellow academy people, find out how they're getting on with the video learning. Or we also do the pub, which is basically just going into a room and chatting about random things um, and just getting to know each other. And, and it is amazing to see there's been so many friendships formed within the academy, lifelong friendships, myself included. I've met so many people. It's just brilliant. And then now and again, you get to meet them in real life and it's it's, it's just the icing on the cake. So uh, so so I think my I, I would love for everybody to join and learn from Lucinda like I have. Um, it will transform your riding. Um, there is no doubt about that. And also share in the misery of the minus five in the morning, going and <laughs> mucking out and doing all of that What's stuff. That minus five in New Zealand? It's summer um, here. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Typical. Oh, here we go. Here, here, how old do you think you need to be to benefit? Is my 11-year-old too young? Very I think good it is a really I honestly, it depends on the child, don't you, Rachel? Because I don't think 11 is too young, but I just think it depends on how much they want it. Mm. Um, we do it, have a lot of parents that join because they've got children and they want to be able to help the kids. Um, and sometimes it is quite funny watching you trying to convince an 11 year old that they need to trot jump and they're not allowed to go and gallop and flat out around the place. But um, there are a lot of parents that join to help and then the, the children join in. So like Lucinda said, it's it really does depend. But there's no time like the present to instill some of those principles. Um, yeah. And and also it is there are lots of fun things. Lucinda and I were riding the other day and we must put this as a lesson. And I said to her, let's go and bed. I had all these posts up. I said, let's go bending yeah. through those boulders, bending poles. And we had so much fun trotting, tried to canter, but they were all a bit close together through bending poles, D the rough ground training, all of that side of it, which is basically designed to bring back the fun and recreate what we did as kids when we just got on our ponies and just went. Um, and that's what all of this is about. Let me inter 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 interrupt you a minute there because it is fun, but there's a damn good reason for a bending race. Because you've got to be able to manoeuvre your horse. And interestingly, you were watching Pippa and Tina's lecture demo. I had to leave because I had to fly out here halfway through. They did it too, didn't they? They did, yeah. They up the idea of bending. And we'd been talking about it on, on one of our masterminds. Mm. And uh, they started to pick up the idea at whatever show they were at, just putting out um, wings or something and just playing to teach them. Actually, for that level, it was to teach them flying changes. 
But yeah. any level, just maneuvering them around and learning how much outside rain and how much leg and how much balance here, there and everywhere. Actually, a brilliant idea. I'm forever grateful to the Pony Club for developing children in the right way by doing Jim Carner games. So many of them have a really good reason behind them. Yeah. Um, right, there are a few more here, which is brilliant. Um, sh- do, 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 do. Uh, when we join, this is Paula Ibsen, um, is there a date day time for talks yes so it's always um eight o'clock gmt um those those are the times and they occasionally vary but not very often um but as i said they are um recorded and then available on the replay in the hub afterwards um so yes there that is a yes uh, and then Alice Jennings says, apparently she really wants it. Well, absolutely join. You must. And we will welcome her with open arms. <laughs> and uh, it sounds like she's really super keen, which is exactly what you need. Uh, Deb Shepherd, if kids aren't exposed to it, how would they learn it? Yes to the 11 year old. There you go. There we go. Thank you, Deb. That's lovely. I love that. Yeah. That's pretty good common sense there. And actually, just about everything we do is based on common sense. It is, as mm. somebody wonderfully said, not so common anymore. <laughs> it's true. I love that. Somebody said that. Well, I think that was you, wasn't it? Common sense, which isn't very common. I'd love to take the, the credit, but it wasn't. It was not originally. <laughs> I mean, but it's brilliant and it is so true especially in this crazy age that we've entered with you know health and safety and boys can wear dresses to school mm. and all this sort of thing. Mm. You know, common sense is not so common anymore but that really honestly so much of all that we do with horses is based on common sense but it's just nice when it's backed up by people knowing that it works whatever the way that the system I'll use it for Rachel's sake whatever the system is Oh dear. I never thought I'd see the day that Lucinda said said the word system. <laughs> Brilliant. Okay, well, I think we are coming to the end. If there's any more questions, pop them in the chat, but um I'll wait for another second or two. Um in the meantime, I really look forward to um welcoming some of you onto the academy um and to join the fun. Join the gang. It's a definite gang now, isn't it? <laughs> that is a wonderful oh. gang too we have so much fun and that is important as I, my dad said to me before yep. I went on my first episode remember old girl you do it for fun yeah <laughs> <laughs> I never <laughs> remember that yeah there, there is not a lot of fun in the start box of some of those big events that's for sure but it's a lot of fun yeah. afterwards <laughs> mm. okay exactly right <laughs> wonderful thanks everybody oh, Mente we- says she's just rejoined woohoo you must have been a member and now you've rejoined that is amazing right sometimes people back, go Mente. through a little bit of a financial crunch and they come out and then they come back again yeah. that, that's life we know that it we is worth mentioning that. that you can cancel at any time no questions are asked it's yes. absolutely yes. fine so it's uh it's 25 pounds really and then you can give it a test and see if you're right. we're going to work in dollars soon we are going to work in dollars we've been told so uh but we couldn't quite get it ready for this one but the 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 next one will be in dollars okay oh she said she pulled out due to injury but she's better now yes brilliant see that stripe on the shoulder that's sun (laughs) yeah it's pitch black here it was (laughs) (laughs) okay bye everybody great to have you on thank you so much okay Bye -bye. bye bye